Now that we've written two functions to compute the future worth of money, we need to make a main script which calls, or uses, the functions. In the script, we'll test the functions for one set of parameters, and then we'll see how changing the interest rate affects the future worth. Open a new script file, not a function file. It's always a good idea to start your script with a descriptive title and some housekeeping commands. Let's go ahead and save the file. Unlike function files, scripts can be flexibly named. However, you cannot name your script the same name as a function file. We cannot call this file either one of these two names because it'll overwrite whatever's contained in the function. We'll perform a parameter study in this script, so let's call it futureworth underscore study. The first thing we want to do is test the functions we wrote with a simple test case. Let's say the present worth of our money, P, is $100,000. Let's use an interest rate of 5% or 0 0.05, and let's compound it for 10 years, so n equals 10. Let's also set plot status equal to 1 so we can turn the plots on. Now we need to call the functions. The easiest way to do this is by copying and pasting the function definitions into our script. We have two output f's. To prevent overriding, I'll call the first f f underscore vec and the second one f underscore loop. This is legal since variable names can be changed at will. Upon running the code, you get two vectors in the command window. Both of these vectors are of size 1 by 10. You should always keep track of the dimensions and units of every variable. They look the same, which is good. We can also check the plots, which are identical. Let's confirm this by using the isEqual command like we did in the functions. and we see that is equal returned 1, which confirms similarity between the codes. Now that we know both functions produce the same output, let's see how the interest rate affects the future worth. We're going to use a for loop to repeatedly call one of the two functions, each with a different interest rate. Let's create a vector of the interest rates we want to test. Let's just say we want to test the interest rates from 0 up to 4 times this i value in increments of the i value.
Now we see that the variable idata appears in the workspace. idata is a 1 by 5 vector containing the interest rates from 0 to 0 0.2, or 20%, in increments of 0 0.05, or 5%. We can see this by double-clicking on idata in the workspace. This opens up a tab called Variables, where we can view the values of idata. Once again, always be keeping track of your variables' dimensions. Go back to the other tab to return to the main script. Before the for loop, we should pre-allocate the vector where we store our answers. Let's call this vector fdata. We should think about the dimensions of fdata before we continue programming. When we call our function with a single interest rate, we get a 1 by 10 vector of future values. Now we have five different interest rates, so let's store the future values induced by each different interest rate in its own row idata has five elements, therefore fdata will have five rows and ten columns. We can pre-allocate the fdata matrix by using the zeros command to create a 5 by 10 zero matrix. Let's inspect this in the Variables tab. Double-click on the fdata variable in the workspace. As expected, fdata is a 5 by 10 zero matrix. Notice how I used length of i data and length of f underscore vec instead of hard coding in 5 and 10. You should strive to make your codes as general as possible in case you change your parameters. If i data became 6 elements long instead of 5, this line would still be the same because we didn't hard code 5 in for length of i data. I should also note that I chose to use the length of f underscore vec, but you could also use length of f underscore loop because they're identical. Before we start looping, let's turn off the plots so we don't generate a bunch of unnecessary plots. Now we can code the loop. Remember, we are filling in each row of f data with the results from the particular interest rate from the i data vector, so we can use the colon operator to aid us. The loop counter k starts at 1, increments in 1, and stops at the length of i data, which is 5 in this case. Here's the colon operator. This says to fill all the columns in the kth row of the f data matrix with the future worth values using the kth interest rate from the i data vector. For example, when k equals 2, we fill the entire second row of the f data matrix with the future worth values corresponding to an interest rate of the second element in i data, or 0.05. I use the vectorized version of the code here, but you could also use the loop based version if you want. Since they produce the same results, it's really a matter of personal preference. Let's run the code to see if it works. Go back to the variables tab. All the zeros became other numbers, so at least the code did something. Let's plot this matrix. I'm going to copy and paste the plotting code from the vectorized function. We need to make some changes. First, we need to change the nn just to 1 to n since nn doesn't appear anywhere in the script. We also need to change the f to fdata. 
Instead of plotting with blue diamonds with a connecting line, I'm just going to specify that all the points are going to be circles with a connecting line. The X and Y labels can stay the same, but the title should be changed to something a little more fitting. We should also add a legend describing the different interest rates since we're plotting multiple lines on the same plot. This is pretty convoluted, so let's break it down starting with the arguments of the repmap command. Size of iData transpose returns 5 by 1, which makes sense since iData itself is a 1 by 5 vector. This i equals is just a character string. Repmap returns the string in a matrix of this size. If we enter this into the command window, we'll just get this i equal string printed in a 5 by 1 vector. We then concatenate it with the num2 string of i data transpose command, which is just the transpose of the i data vector converted to a string via the num2 string. And if we put the whole bracketed term together, we can form the text that'll appear in the legend. The location northwest just puts the legend in the upper left corner of the plot. Let's run the code and check it out. The last thing we need to do is interpret the results. This flat blue line corresponds to no interest, which makes sense because your money won't appreciate if there's no interest rate. As the interest rate goes up, the future worth appears to increase as well, which is also logical because the future worth and interest rate are related by a power function. And obviously, investing for longer will boost the future value. These are just some things that we can take away from this plot. And that's it for this video. To recap, we wrote a vectorized function and a loop-based function in separate function m files. These functions produced identical outputs. We then made a script m file, which called the two function m files to perform a parameter study. We saw how changing the interest rate changes the future worth of our money. You'll be doing this kind of analysis for the rest of the semester, and probably for the rest of undergrad, so study these examples carefully. See you soon.